Uh, so I'd like to introduce everyone to Albert uh, Pinuela, uh, who is a lecturer, assistant professor in computer science and knowledge engineering at the Department of Informatics in King College London, sorry, King's College London. Uh, he obtained a PhD in Amsterdam in 2016 under the supervision of uh, Frank von uh, Harl Harmelin, uh, I'm sorry if I, I butchered these, uh, Stefan Schlobach and uh, Andrea uh, Schornhorst. Please, uh, apologies, uh, Albert, you can uh, please feel free to correct me afterwards. Uh, and, and his research focused on uh, multimodal knowledge graphs and web querying and cultural AI. Um, he's done, he'll be doing some great work on knowledge graphs uh, that he'll be presenting right now. And with that, uh, I would love for you to, to start and, and as always, uh, tell me how, how badly I butchered those, those advisors. <laughs> no, it, it was great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Keith. Thanks for the very nice introduction. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, making sure that I'm sharing the sound because I want to talk about uh, music knowledge graphs uh, eventually. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I think I shared the, the audio correctly, so uh, uh, we'll, um, we'll get to that in a while. So uh, thanks very much, Keith, for the nice introduction and Alma for the organization. And thanks, uh, Philip, for the really nice invitation to talk uh, to you today uh, at ISI. I always thought that my first visit to ISI would be you know, the first time I ever set foot on California, which is something I've been willing to do for a really long time. Um, but well, for now, it, it, uh, this this virtual meeting will uh, will have to do. So, uh, thank you all very much for uh, 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 for uh, uh, being here today. I would like to talk to you today a little bit about um, supporting cultural AI with uh, multimodal knowledge graphs. So, um, and I'll be trying to convince you that it's really important that we pay attention to multimodality in knowledge graphs. And that we think a little bit outside of, you know, the typical stereotypes and conventions that we think about when we think about knowledge graphs, and also a little bit about the social processes and the cultural contexts in which um, uh, knowledge graphs are uh, typically embedded. But also, in you know, in a more general sense, like the culture and social understandings that it would be good for AI to have if we if we really want it to be more humanly uh, approachable. So just to complement a little bit what, uh, what Keith has been, has been saying, I'm a lecturer, system professor in computer science and knowledge engineering at King's College London since last September. And before that, I was a postdoc at the Knowledge Representation and Reasoning Group that's led by Frank and Carmelin, um, where I also did my PhD. So I spent quite some time in, uh, in Amsterdam. I had a, a wonderful time there. Uh, where I also had the opportunity to interact a lot with people in the cultural heritage sector, but with my own lenses uh, on computer science and knowledge engineering. So that was a really interesting experience. Um, and I also learned a lot from scholars in the digital humanities and, uh, and artists, uh, musicians, and so on. Um, I'm a musician myself, not so good, I would say, but I have, you know, I just have a great time learning how jazz works and, and the theory, you know, the math behind music. Um, so I had some roles in, in, in large digital humanities infrastructure projects there, and those are the logos of the institutions that have been uh, funding my research uh, uh, so far in uh, during all these years. Okay, um, I think uh, you'll probably all be familiar with uh, tweets and demos like this. I think it's pretty exciting times for AI. We've been seeing huge advances in in a lot of fronts, uh, this is a demo of GPT-3. So GPT-3 is a transformer-based um, um, architecture that can learn language models, uh, very large language models at an incredible level of, of precision using supervised learning, right? So what you can typically do is just, you know, you, you train large corpora next to, you know, an annotated data set, in this case, just a big bunch of HTML. Um, and then you can get to things like this, right? So you can just input uh, a, what we call a conditional sample to the model, you know, large text that says, welcome to my newsletter, and blue button that does blah, blah, blah. So just a human-like description of a, 
of an HTML interface. And then GPT-3 can just generate the HTML translation uh, of that description. And that turns out to be valid, uh, syntactically and semantically valid HTML, right? So it just paints, uh, just output something that an HTML renderer can, can perfectly render on screen. So that that's just um, mind blowing. Uh, at least it was for me when I saw it um, uh, last year. And I thought, okay, perhaps we can do this for something uh, interesting, right? So, and what I thought would be, could we build a language model of all the semantic web papers ever written, for example? And for those of you who are not doing research on the semantic web, you can think of this as, you know, as just a large collection of proceedings. Uh, just imagine the large collection of proceedings of, of, of the field of, of, of AI or computer science in which you work um, on. And, uh, well, we basically retrained uh, GPT-2 in this case because we did not have uh, the resources to do it with GPT-3 and trained the language model on semantic web papers, right? And then we would just pose questions uh, to, this, um, to this language model. And what you see here in the examples in bold, that's what, um, that's what the conditional sample was to the uh, to the model, right? So, for example, an explanation for the absence of effective and general methods for ontology matching is, and then you know this introduction is full of intent, right? Because we're meaning for the language model to complete the sentence and give us what the explanation is for this, right? And then we get the typical responses we would expect from such language models, right? So. Um, it, in this case, it would say that we are unable to match the main ontologies on all of the instances. And however, we have already performed the blah, 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 instances and found that they do not match most features of the domain ontology. So, okay. So as always, you know, syntax is very good. Uh, semantics are a bit off, but there are some quite accurate mentions of things that we would expect to be important in ontology matching, right? Like, you know, like matching on all instances, in the second case, uh, you know, large scale reasoning about, uh, you know, complexity of rules and, you know, an input explicit knowledge, or, you know, the fact that machine learning is really good for entity linking because of issues of scale, because of issues of accuracy. So it's not, it's not really that far off. Uh, if you're interested in the clean corpus of, uh, of ESWC and ISWC papers, um, a conference which just finished yesterday, by the way, um, I, I, I can definitely give you a, a point. So with all these advances, you know, some people are just, you know, are just all hyped and just saying, oh, this is human-like intelligence. Uh, you know, if, if we conquer language models, we'll be conquering AI, right? And then as a musician, this always strikes like somewhat the wrong note with me. Uh, because I, I work a lot with people in, 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 in music and in musical creativity. And um, I'm often reminded of this paper, right? And papers like this. So basically in this paper, the authors argue that, uh, you know, even if language is viewed as this, you know, feat of human intelligence, um, humans can be seen and often is very useful to observe language as a kind of music, right? Because language is so much more than what the, you know, GPT-2 or GPT-3 or, you know, any of these models actually see in their input. Uh, so when we use language, we use pitch, we use volume, we use um, uh, rest, uh, we use rhythm, we use all these um, different musical features, right? Um, and it's, it's quite impossible to sort of, um, to, to separate uh, you know the content of the message of the message from the audio signal that we use to uh, to convey the message. Uh, you know, way beyond um, a, a simple you know sort of speech to text uh, translation. So um, take away from this slide, you know, natural language is a type of, of music or a subset of music, to put it like very provocatively. Um, and this got me thinking because usually in knowledge graphs we have these very Textual way of thinking about uh, the logic of, of encoding, you know, logical statements in the in the knowledge graph, right? And this would be a prototypical example, um, radically simple, right? So uh, an English sentence that says Dante wrote uh, the Divine Comedy, uh, which is true, um, and then we make this almost immediate translation of 
an English simple sentence into the architecture of the notes graph, right? So we say, oh, then, you know, subject and object are um, uh, these uh, noun phrases and they must go to notes. And then the action, the verb connecting these two uh, uh, noun phrases, that, that is the predicate, right? So that's the relation uh, connecting these two notes. And this is this is perfectly fine and good. And I realize this is a radically simple uh, example. I'm not here to uh, to mod any people doing NLP uh, and relation extraction. Um, but then my question is, okay, then how do we encode other kinds of knowledge, right? So how do we encode knowledge that doesn't come naturally in the form of of text, or or that is very very hard to encode as text, which is, which happens very very often in cultural heritage domains. For example, if we have music registers, if we have a musical score, which is full of knowledge and full of meaning, um, and, you know, and proxies to audio representations of that score, like spectrograms, uh, self-similarity matrices, like, how do we encode that in a knowledge graph? How do we get knowledge from those multimodal cultural sources and encode them as knowledge graphs so that we can work with them, you know, in the usual ways in which we operate knowledge coming from text? So that's going to be driving uh, the rest of the talk, right? Um, and um, I often use this sentence from um, from Marcus from last year, in which he says that well, that many of the problems that we are facing today with AI are very much rooted in the lack of symbolic representations of uh, many important things, right? So here um, he's saying external cultural knowledge, right? So that's why I'm, I'm using the sentence, of course. You could also see this as some sort of common sense knowledge. And I know you guys are doing some research uh, on, on, on uh, some very important research on, on common sense knowledge graphs. So that is very much needed if we wanna add that additional uh, layer of, of, of say of, of, of meaning grasping uh, for, uh, for AI. And the reason I chose cultural knowledge besides you know, uh, me being crazy about uh, human culture is that it, it really puts on the spot these um, challenging aspects, right? So the fact of multimodality, not everything comes from text. Um, the, fact, uh, the, the, the issue of subjectivity. So the fact that um, some of the statements that you make about cultural heritage artifacts, for example, are not absolute or are very hard to uh, crystallize and, and make concrete. Another aspect is their interfaceability. So people usually need to interact with this um, uh, with these cultural heritage assets, you know, sort of decomplexifying uh, their inner workings. So the way a musicologist understands music has nothing to do with you know our layman interpretation of, of music. And uh, they also have a need for transparency. So they can help a lot if we can attach these cultural notions to AI. Well. I believe we can then make AI a little bit more transparent because at least there is a chance of connecting, you know, conclusions or connecting uh, causes to our cultural understanding of the world, right? Which very, very much goes along with our common sense understanding of the world. So I think these these two issues are very much related. So uh, in in this sense, these are the drivers of of the of these three main, main research questions, right? So what are adequate knowledge representations for multimodal cultural uh, artifacts and cultural data. How can we combine them uh, reliably and at scale when we have them in the form of, uh, of, of knowledge graphs? And what data structures and uh, you know, models and algorithms uh, we can use to, you know, to sort of embed this surrounding social behavior uh, into them? So uh, this is the, the, the main idea. So I would like to start uh, addressing this with some of the work that we've done on building these multimodal knowledge graphs. And in the beginning, it was you know, it was it was sort of a um, it was sort of a, a curiosity exercise, right? So we know that data comes from many many different sources, and um, here we you know we just interacted with a few different projects that had data sources of many different kinds. So for example, we developed um, ontologies and, and converters for generating knowledge graphs from uh, historical spreadsheets with statistical data. Um, 
historical uh, CSVs with geographical data with changing boundaries in, in, in municipalities of the historical municipalities of the Netherlands uh, across centuries. Um, and also from uh, MIDI files with musical data. So generating knowledge graphs directly from uh, music notation. And this sort of you know, opened up the stage for all these different you know, multimodality and the fact that you can have knowledge graphs that encode uh, subtle uh, uh, definitions of, of, of cultural meaning. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit into, into the second one. So the red spot, uh, that MIDI knowledge graph of uh, 10 billion triples because um, MIDI is a really uh, interesting format. So uh, some of you might remember from the eighties uh, that this was a, uh, it was sort of a standard, an industrial standard for uh, synthesizer music exchange really. And the way, uh, so the way to think about MIDI is actually quite simple. So it's actually the same as thinking about triples. Uh, or three-dimensional vectors um, of integers. And these are probably the two simplest messages that you can send over a MIDI channel that any synthesizer will understand. So the first one, it says, so the first number encodes, uh, it's 144, that's 90 in hex. And the nine uh, is about the, the type of event, right? So this would be the ontology class one ontology class, right? Um, and in this, in this particular case, nine in MIDI means note on. So the event this first vector is encoding is that somebody is pressing or starting to play a note in say a keyboard. And then the zero of that hex is the channel because MIDI has different channels for simultaneous events. Then the second number 60, that's the pitch. So that's the, the specific key in the, in the piano or the keyboard that's being pressed. And if you start counting from left to right in the piano, number 60 is middle C. So that's the specific uh, piano key that's being pressed because that's what the 144 tell, tells us. And then the last number, the 100, that's the velocity. So that's how hard you know, the, the musician is striking the, 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 that middle C key uh, in the middle of the piano. And that's quite hard because you know, this goes from zero to 127. So it's almost as hard as you can press it. Um, and then these second, so there you go, right? So this is just the act of pressing one particular note in an instrument. And this one below is the act of releasing uh, the, that same key because we're, we're given the same pitch uh, at a different velocity though. So a little bit slowly, uh, slower. Um, uh, and this just encodes that the fact that this is a note off. So end of the note. So that's it, right? So, and this is an oversimplified uh, way of looking at MIDI. The standard conveys many different things like changing instruments um, and many, 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 many more. Um, but this is sort of like the basic uh, workings of the, of the standard. And then one can obviously think of generating knowledge graphs out of these you know, completely meaningless integers and making, you know, adding some semantics to the soup, right? And coming up with an ontology and coming up with a vocabulary describing all these different musical actions that musicians can take on the stage and letting you know machines operate on 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 that meaning so um, um besides the ontology we also absorbed very very large uh midi data sets that we gather from the web uh that contain up to half a million midi files from all periods of time um you can get uh, music from the baroque to you know, video game music, uh, pop from the 80s, obviously, um, and many, many uh, other examples. So I uh, invite you to, to go to the, to the portal and take a look at the, at, the, at, the, at the knowledge graph. So, but what happens with, you know, the MIDI, uh, the MIDI knowledge graph is what happens with, you know, probably almost any other knowledge graph that's been extracted automatically from, uh, from sources. And that is that uh, it's incomplete, right? So we have missing links, we have uh, missing notes, we have missing pieces, we have missing metadata, very important problem in using information retrieval. Um, the knowledge graph is incomplete and uh, we need to complete it if we wanna uh, provide an, a useful resource to, uh, to musicians and to users. So the first, 
so the first important part that was incomplete is precisely the metadata of the graph, right? So there are many, many MIDI files that, okay, we have some nodes, uh, that's nice. We have them expressed in a semantically interpretable uh, way. That's also very nice, but we miss uh, we miss the metadata. We don't know who the author is. We don't know uh, you know when it was done, why, where, uh, all these important uh, problems, questions. So what we did to address this was two different things. So one was to try to um, identify duplicates and songs that are musically similar to each other to see if we could establish some links and whether that could help with completion. And for this, we just used something that uh, people in music information retrieval called uh, geometric melodic similarity. So you can just think of a song, uh, you can just reduce a song to its, uh, to its melodic pattern, right? So la 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 la, right? So that would be like, a, you know, some sort of like mountain. Um, and then that depicts a geometric form. And then just by, you know, but by simple a diff of the areas compressed between the two forms, you can know how similar, melodically similar to different pieces are. So that can give you a notion of, of melodic similarity. And we mix this with uh, what we, you see here. So some user input. So people can just play songs uh, in, a, in a MIDI device like this keyboard. And then they can annotate, they can they just provide, provide external metadata to what they played. And then with that external metadata, we can just uh, run some, essentially some entity reconciliation, right? So we can look at different sources. We looked at uh, the DBPD ontology uh, using, you know, the, the ahocoristic distance uh, to see what uh, entities that we already had were, could be quite similar. And then, as a result, we sort of provided that missing piece to the music knowledge graph, right? So instead of a bunch of random nodes, anonymous random nodes, we would have, we could uh, launch queries like this. So we could launch queries that interrogated the musical part of the, of the knowledge graph, right? So, you know, technical aspects like the numerator and the denominator of the, of the song. So this has to do with the, with the time signature, right? So the, the, the pace of the, of the, of the music together with some metadata. So here we're looking for, you know, for things in standard, uh, in standard time, that's two fours that deal with the subject Romeo and Juliet. And the answer to this query are, you know, uh, for example, Romeo and Juliet by Dire Straits and, you know, and some other popular songs that have to do with Romeo and Juliet in, uh, in standard time. Now this was nice, um, but, um, of course, uh, sy symbolically uh, completing this knowledge graph is uh, quite inefficient, right? Because we have to compare all pairs. Uh, there is this uh, demanding um, input from, uh, from users uh, for the metadata. So we thought to ourselves, if we couldn't use one of these, you know, really fancy neural networks to sort of, uh, uh, and some supervised data set to, to try to, uh, to do the task for us. And that's exactly what we did with midi to vec So midi to vec is, a, is an embedding for, uh, for music in MIDI format, specifically designed for tasks of uh, link prediction with uh, high level metadata. So basically what we did was we just took uh, MIDI files, which are like some proxy to musical scores. You can think of, they're not exactly scores, but you can think of them like that. And then, we represent those MIDIs as a knowledge graph, just as I showed you before. And then we reduce that knowledge graph, that knowledge graph to a, uh, a uh, multidimensional embedding, right? So this is a geometric tensor. This is just a, a numeric representation of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the graph. And then we use labeled examples over parts of that graph to tell the uh, a feed for all neural network that um, that particular sequence of nodes or that particular part of the graph, you know, was related to this particular composer or it was written in this particular year or it belongs to this particular genre, right? And then the network did learn all these high level features, right? So that it could, it could observe a little part of a completely anonymous piece of music and it would be able to tell you, okay, I think this is Beethoven and I think this is an adagio. And we run these trained embeddings over very, very large data. Well, some of them not so large, but then some other very large data sets. And the network has surprising performance and scalability, right? So 
uh, we could match. Um, so for Maketa, we could match the performance of some uh, systems that do this uh, via heuristics in uh, in uh, for a low number of classes, and then it the network does keep up for higher numbers of classes, and even for you know tasks like um, like the music brain stack prediction, which you know which tries to predict whether something is jazz and loose or is electronic. So we have a great variety of genera. Um, so this was really uh, interesting and really nice. The network does travel with some things, like for example, in compositionality. So when it has to detect whether something is um, is uh, you know a composition of of two things, right? So whether it's something something is pop rap, right? So it it can get really confused in in mistaking one for the other uh, because actually you know both members are are sort of uh, implied. All right, so uh, this is the work that we did for uh, multimodal knowledge graph uh, completion. And, you know, being, being working with musicians is just unavoidable to think, okay, can we use these models and uh, not just to, you know, to complete knowledge graphs and do some basic queries, but to actually generate uh, some, uh, some new music, which is, you know, a feature that we know that, you know, variational autoencoders, that transformers, that all these models can do. And, the first thing we did was, uh, just as before, was to try it by ourselves symbolically, right? And this is what uh, the Sparkle DJ does. So uh, uh, this is what a student of mine uh, came up with. So basically, this is the idea of, of mashups. So mashups are compositions that, um, that DJs create just by taking existing tracks of existing songs, and, they, and then they just put them together because, you know, they match rhythmically and they match harmonically and you know some other technical terms. So this is an example of a human made mashup. Hit me generals gathered in their masses. Get out the way. Just like witches at black masses. Right, so there you go. So you can clearly hear that this is war pigs by Black Sabbath on, on the one hand. Then there's this conversation with uh, with the hip hop song, right? So, so there you go. That's a classic uh, mashup. And then our idea was to see if we could come up with some particular query Sparkle query templates that would construct new musical knowledge graphs uh, just using basic matching criteria. So the basic matching criteria that DJs use to generate these mashups when they are in the in the studio. Um, and this worked to a great extent, especially if the if the existing tracks in the you know in the big in that big ten billion triple uh, MIDI knowledge graph uh, do contain uh, some rhythmical and harmonic similarities. So here are two examples of songs that are found to be matching. Uh, this is the first one. Right a classic song, uh, Michelle, by the Beatles. Uh, this is another one. So that was uh, exactly uh, smell, Smells Like Teen Spirit by uh, Nirvana. And this is what Sparkle DJ can do at, when it identifies both as a match. So you can really pick the parts of both songs that sort of go well together and assemble them as a as a genuine uh, new creation. So uh, this was, of course, uh, lots of fun. Um, but we we did uh, we followed a similar approach as we did before with uh, with knowledge graph completion, right? So we wanted to know if sub symbolically uh, we could come up with one of those language models. Uh, to uh, to generate believable samples of uh, of music, and we took a radically different approach with this one. So basically, what we did was not just to consider music as some sort of natural language, which many many people do, um, but we took Sonic Pi, which is actually a programming language. Uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with uh, with the concept of uh, uh, leaf coding. So leaf coding is um, is half a Hackathon, uh, so to say, 
and half a performance. And the basic idea is that we have we have this person, so he's the live coding performer, and he just you know has this big screen behind him, and he's just coding in this programming language. There are many different ones. Uh, Sonic Pi is just one of them. And then the code that he writes, it's always playable. So you can always ask the interface, okay, play what's written right now. And then you have these really long sessions in which the performance consists of just writing code and you know just letting the engine play and play again the changing code to you know to just generate the music um so what we did here was just to think okay so if if these language models so in this case we we again use transformers if, they, if these language models are good at uh learning the language model model behind you know uh, uh a programming language um can are these valid sonic pipe programs and can we play them and uh, this is very preliminary, so it's it's very soon to give an answer to uh, to this question. Uh, but some of the samples are syntactically valid, and a few of them are actually semantically valid and musically executable. So uh, this is one. Uh, this is what one of these uh, generated Sonic Pi examples sounds like. So very atmospheric. Uh, the difference is mostly due to the you know the nature of the engine, uh, but I think you uh, you get the you get the gist. Um, this is yet another work from a different student. Uh, I'll go through this one uh, quickly. The main takeaway from this one is that this one is truly interactive. So you know uh, transformers can generate samples based on something called conditional sampling. So you need to give a first uh, phrase or a first sentence. Um, and then what this student did was just to combine human uh, uh, human input, so human samples, with the responses from the model. And there's more or less uh, two measures of human input and two measures of uh, machine generated uh, music. And you can see that the structure and the and the and the consistent and the consistency improves. Right, so uh, you can see there is almost a conversation between uh, between the human measures and the machine measures. All right, so uh, this led to another very interesting problem, which is uh, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, and it deals with the fact that all these sub symbolic um, 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 uh, approaches sort of rely on a um, on a low on a transformation into low dimensionality of the of the original knowledge graphs, right? So whatever you had in in original shape, uh, these things work best when you have sequences, right? So when you have you know collections of items that come one after the other, just as in text, right? Um, uh, and that's that's the basic idea. Well, well, as it happens in the semantic web and in and in knowledge graphs, we don't really have sequences, right? So we have graphs and then we need to come up with ways of flattening out those graphs and we do this by using random walks and some people use semantics in those random walks and there's lots of uh, research going on there uh, but we're asking ourselves something different here so we're asking ourselves okay even if you know the graph is the paradigm of publishing data in, in the semantic web um, how much of it are actually sequences so how many of them are uh, you know naturally naturally uh uh occurring uh sequences of of data and do not make use of the graph feature uh right but it's just very very long lists of uh of items and this is exactly what we did in uh in 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 this project um with the open university and so we we we, we learned a couple of things so the first thing we learned is that uh socially people have a certain tendency on modeling lists and sequences according to these six different uh we'll call them sequence patterns or list patterns right uh, they make use of the rdf sequence um, um uh, predicate they order lists by uri uh, they order lists by literals they use the you know the lisp like 
um, um, uh, are the feature and implementation of lists and so on and so forth, right? Um, so these were the naturally occurring lists and uh, that we organized into six different patterns. And then we implemented, you know, a set of Sparkle Cree templates and actually an entire benchmark uh, to see, uh, you know, how expensive it is to actually operate on, on these sequences, on these lists. Um, and the results were quite interesting. So as it happens, you know, uh, you might think, okay, RTF list is a really elegant uh, data model for modeling sequences and for modeling these uh, these lists, uh, which it actually is. But this sort of you know um, uh, this elegant uh, elegancy, uh, let's say, uh, comes at a price, right? And most engines that we tested uh, really struggled with um, with answering you know uh, scale queries that interrogate very very long sequences of elements. In, uh, in, uh, in lists that occur naturally in, uh, in the semantic web. Uh, so typically, you know, um, implementations that use SEC, so that use uh, the RTF SEC collection um, are much more efficient to, uh, to query, but it really depends on the operation. So if you wanna retrieve the whole list, if you wanna delete an, an element from the list, uh, if you want to add an element uh, to the list in one very specific place, of course, each of these implementations have their, you know, their pros and cons and their strengths and weaknesses. So if you ever need to model, you know, sequences in, in a knowledge graph, I will encourage you to, to take a look at the paper. Okay, um, on to the last part. So, so far I've been talking about, you know, this multimodality, musical knowledge graphs, uh, they're incomplete. We need efficient ways of completing them and linking them to other non-musical knowledge graphs. We can generate music with them. We need to, there is this need for, uh, you know, efficiently processing uh, sequences to make use of sub-symbolic methods. Um, but then, you know, the common, just the, the way in which we most commonly use knowledge graphs is not really any of that. So uh, the way we usually use knowledge graphs in our everyday life and, you know, for application developers mostly is uh, we query them. Right, so we just write queries typically in Sparkle or in GraphQL or in one of these graph languages. And then we get data from these uh, knowledge graphs and then we do stuff with that data. We build applications or apps for your phone or uh, whatever. Um, so, and as it happens, it's quite challenging to write these queries, right? Because developers are typically not really used to the paradigm of uh, interrogating knowledge graphs. You know, it's becoming more and more popular, sure. Um, but on the web, um, it's way more common just to follow the, what we call the REST uh, API paradigm, right? So just thinking of, uh, you know, of a sort of a given specification of the resources and methods that we can use to interrogate a data source. It doesn't need to be a knowledge graph. And then that sort of that that's sufficient for uh, for most users, at least from a practical point of view. So uh, what the really smart guys at OpenFax came up with was was with the idea of bringing the best of both worlds, right? So um, from here, so from the Sparkle endpoint to the bottom, uh, this is just the traditional way of doing data integration using knowledge graphs, right? So we, you, we would have a Sparkle endpoint, and then we would have all these different data sources. And then we would have RDF and ontologies and uh, you know and rules and all those nice things that would put all the information from the different data sources into a you know into an integrated data space. Um, this could actually be a multimodal cultural heritage block, but anyway, uh, this happened in the in the domain of pharma, so uh, quite different. Um, and then on top of that, on top of the Sparkle endpoint they would deploy a, a REST API that would take care of sending the queries to the, to the, to the endpoint and not directly expose the endpoint uh, to the public, right? And this turned out to be a really intelligent decision because you know, it helps with separation of concerns and users don't really need to learn this Sparkle GraphQL graph query language if they don't want to. They can just use the REST principles and just you know just use the resources uh, as any other resource on the web. Um, and this is quite nice. The problem is 
you need to manually write these uh, APIs on top of Sparkle endpoints. And it's really time consuming and it's really boring for developers because it's 90% of the times it's time and again doing the same thing, writing a Sparkle query, writing the method above it, uh, selecting, you know, filling in the documentation to the API done and then off we go with the, with the next operation. So it's really uh, boring. And the second point is it's really bad for query management because all these APIs that I showed before, they just uh, rely on the, on, the, on, the, on the assumption that this REST API is containing the hard-coded queries that are going to be used to implement the API methods, right? And that just, it's really bad practice because queries end up you know, hard written in, in application code. So they're really hard to maintain, they're really hard to update. Um, and in general, there's just poor query, uh, query management on top of that. So what we tried to do with this project was just to leverage uh, the existence of a perfectly valid query management system that's out there, and it's called GitHub. And we usually use it for managing source code, um, but it turns out we can also use it for uh, managing uh, queries, and in particular queries in Sparkle. And if we just do something very simple, which is just storing one Sparkle query in one file and drop it on GitHub, then we've got all these nice features, right? So we get good support of, you know, of creation of the queries, we get versioning, we get branching, people can send us pull requests and so on and so forth. So it really pushes forward the collaborative aspect of writing Sparkle queries. We don't need to do it anymore on our own. We can do it as a social, uh, activity as many other social activities that happen in, in application development. Plus, it comes with all these really nice web-friendly features, uh, like all queries become globally and uniquely identifiable on the web and dereferenceable. So this means that every query can be um, uniquely identified, uh, you know, in web systems, and it can be retrieved uh, real time uh, just using HTTP and content negotiation. So we use this to, uh, to throw something that we call social querying, um, collaborative social querying, which mainly consists on just dropping Sparkle queries on GitHub, just as I showed before. It doesn't need to be GitHub, but you know, uh, it's, a, it's a good proxy that uh, most of you will know. And with basic YAML annotations on top of the queries, uh, we can just create this REST APIs automatically. There is no development work involved and um, and users can directly generate these APIs on the spot and interrogate the APIs on the spot uh, if they wish uh, if they wish to do so. So this is just an example, an arbitrarily complex Sparkle query. It doesn't matter what it does or, or what it means. What matters is that it has all this nice metadata on top um, that uh, uh, processors can use to generate uh, APIs on the fly. Uh, just by retrieving them from the web, as I uh, as I explained before. So this is exactly what Garlic does. So Garlic is a service that um, grabs Sparkle queries shared on GitHub, uh, just as I explained, and then using all these different API endpoints, it just retrieves them and uses their metadata and their contents to build up uh, REST APIs uh, uh, that implement their functionality uh, in a completely automatic uh, automatic way. So uh, this is a really um, easy way for developers that have never interacted with knowledge graphs or the semantic web to, uh, to get a quick and easy interface that they, uh, that they know very, very well. So uh, there you go. There's a public instance of garlic. We have Docker containers, uh, 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 pip, um, PyPy packages. So I encourage you to try it out if you, you, know, if you need to interact with knowledge graphs and uh, want to offer uh, your users, uh, uh, you know, a very direct and easy way of, 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 of accessing them. So I really want to use my last uh, three minutes to give you a taste of other things that we are doing at, at King's College London uh, regarding uh, knowledge engineering, collaborative uh, uh, ontology engineering, uh, you know, social computing, and uh, you know, on cultural heritage. Uh, this is a good example of that. So this is a project 
uh, that uh, Maria is doing right now on innovation. So we're interested in the history of innovation and how innovation um, uh, and AI uh, can help in understanding it uh, using uh, patents as a proxy, right? So, uh, and it deals a lot with assessing the needs of data-driven startups and, you know, and training and recommendations to, um, to support uh, the European Commission's values in the corporate and the industrial world. So uh, that's something that, that we're doing at the moment. Uh, something very different that deals more with, uh, with what I said uh, during the presentation is working with quick data. We work a lot, really a lot with quick data. And you know, there's, there isn't time for everything, so I couldn't tell you much about it. But there's a really nice project of a PhD uh, student of us that's uh, rediscovering uh, knowledge engineering practices in Wikidata discussions. So you know that Wikidata items have discussion pages, just as you know, just uh, like Wikipedia articles have discussion pages where people you know discuss about the contents and properties that they should be using to model uh, items. And um, we stumbled upon you know really interesting facts. So she, uh, this is uh, Elizabeth's uh, work. And you know, she found out that conversations are used in very specific ways. Like most, a majority of pages uh, do not have long discussions. Actually, they only have one question and most of the times no answer. Um, so we found that interesting. And then longer conversations and really passionate conversations only happen in these very small cluster at the long tail. Um, that's the pages that accumulate most of the, of the conversations. And in most cases, these conversations are used for a couple of things, depending on their size. So if it's only one comment, then it just contains a suggestion or a fact or a question. Um, and as the conversation increases in size, so as, as we move along the, 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 the long tail, you know, conversations get, get richer. So, you know, are used to solve suggestions, not just the question or suggestion, but just actual, the actual unfolding of everything that happened to address it. Um, but also, you know, as we get to the end of the tale, uh, to these really controversial pages, then, you know, it, it, the conversation can be really about anything. So requests, personal opinions, conflicts, uh, right? Uh, things that get a little bit too heated. Uh, so this is a very similar pattern as we observe in, uh, in Wikipedia in, in, you know, in longer, uh, discussions. And then something else really interesting that Elizabeth found was that um, these discussions support knowledge engineering activities. So one would think that item pages would contain much knowledge engineering, but actually they do. So people discuss all the time about, you know, should we split this item? Uh, should we merge these two items that seem to have, you know, be semantically equivalent? Uh, what are the consequences of using this property or these other property? Um, what's the domain and range of, uh, of these, of these parts. So there are really, really, uh, knowledge engineering discussions, uh, in there and they mix, uh, very, very often with, you know, just subject matter discussions, like things like, you know, biographies and, and chemistry and, uh, uh, you know, and films, but there is a very clear cluster of conversations that deal with, uh, knowledge engineering, uh, which we found, uh, very interesting. Um, this is sort of like the, you know, the overall slide about, uh, about our expertise. Uh, as I said, you know, there are many projects we're working on that deal with data innovation, you know, direct contact with data incubators and accelerators, uh, working with patterns, the history of patterns, data literacy. There's a lot about that. There's also a big cluster of projects um, where we're working on human-centric AI. So this is any architecture, you know, with a human in the loop, Lots of crowdsourcing. Uh, so uh, we have lots of projects that deal directly with, uh, you know, with mechanical Turk, with crowdsourcing platforms for, uh, for data annotation and also participatory and experimental AI. So citizen science uh, and so on and so forth. And then there's this last part of neurosymbolic AI that, you know, relates much more to everything I've been explaining today about knowledge engineering and knowledge graphs, uh, reasoning, agents and provenance. And uh, uh, the last I want to talk about is this project here, Polyphonia. This is an European uh, project that just started this year. Um, I invite you to, to take a look. It's really interesting. It deals with many of the aspects I've been uh, uh, talking about today. Multimodality, knowledge graphs, knowledge graphs for music, 
um, knowledge graph supporting musicians and, and uh, creatives and artists and also musicologists, researchers, scholars. Um, so the motto is playing the soundtrack of our history. So we want to unveil all these multimodal connections between different uh, historical musical knowledge graphs and discover uh, interesting, uh, uh, interesting things uh, in there. Um, this is one of the things that we really are doing as we speak. Um, so Jacopo de Berardini, he's a researcher with us and he's using unsupervised learning for discovering structure in music. So here you see here, so what you see here is the song, a full song, um, and this is a self-similarity matrix. So if you see, you know, the diagonal is just, um, uh, it's just maximum likelihood because we're just comparing one song with itself. But all you see here is just the, the recurrent structure of any audio signal, but just imagine a song. Um, and these are all the different structural hierarchical parts of, uh, of a song. So we find this a really interesting proxy for, uh, for audio and music similarity. And we think we can uh, extrapolate it to, uh, to other areas. And the second area of work is, again, looking at the human side of things and leverage this new idea of the Wikimedia Foundation of using wiki functions. So wiki functions are supposed to implement this idea of abstract Wikipedia so that we can have functions that will generate um, the Wikipedia language dependent articles just using the data that we have in Wikidata because those data are language independent. Um, and then these functions will take care of automatically, artificially generating the language specific, you know, serializations of uh, of those articles and we find this a fascinating idea we're sort of exploiting this idea in uh, muse it and ongoing proposal to achieve oops sorry to achieve these um, not just multi-language artificial translations of wikidata items into wikipedia article uh, articles but to translate uh, cultural artifacts between their modalities right so to have wiki functions to transform a musical piece into its textual representation or a, an, a Wikipedia article, which is text into its musical uh, representation, right? So music that uh, is equivalent to a piece of text, um, you know, piece of music that has an image uh, that represents it, right? So functions that uh, human written functions that really take care of this multimodal translation. Uh, and we think this can be quite uh, powerful and the Wikimedia Foundation thinks this can be a really, a really interesting test bed for, uh, for Wiki functions. So that was all I got really. Uh, this is just a, you know, a quick reminder of everything we went through. You know, the idea of multimodal knowledge graphs beyond the logic of textual statements. There are many different sources of knowledge uh, and uh, cultural heritage is a really interesting domain where to get them. And it's really challenging, right? So it's challenging for multimodeling prediction. It's challenging because of this combination of symbolic and sub symbolic methods. And, you know, just because of its scale in particular with, uh, with list management. And we also saw very quickly, you know, how to leverage the power of, of, of social interaction on the web for querying and who knows if for multimodal and automated um, uh, modality translation. So that was all I got. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you again. Um, and uh, I want to remind everyone to, uh, if they have a question to raise their hand. Uh, Philip, you have a question. So uh, let's start with you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, yeah, thanks, Albert. This was really fun. Um, you know, good to uh, you know, nice to have some uh, music, you know, on a Friday noon. Uh, so I, I had a question about um, the the neurosymbolic sort of integration that you have for, um, you know, for generating music. So you have kind of language models and, and you have this sort of sparkle where you kind of are able to understand which uh, sort of which part of the song, which part, so basically you're able to sort of deconstruct the song and then it then to, to do this kind of meshes like the the ones that you showed with like the Beatles and, and uh, Nirvana or something so I was wondering like how much can can this be stretched further and and whether you have been thinking about this like you know for example 
can you keep adding constraints to this? Can you say, well, you know, I want to generate a song, but you know, the song has to have a solo, or you know, uh, it has to sound a little bit like Beatles and a little bit like I don't know, Massive Attack, or you know, um, I want to have two voices of a male and a female, or I don't know, a bunch of things. Like there are so many things that one could have as a wish list. Um, so is this is this possible? How how difficult would that be? Yeah, that's uh, thanks, Philip. I think I think that's a fascinating question. Um, so I think so the extent to which it can be stretched, I'm not 100% sure. So what we've seen is that the, the plain and direct usage of existing, uh, uh, you know, sequence encoding and, and you know, in general language models, uh, do not give you all these, you know, musical notions. So they can do a lot. They can so they can learn, you know, they can learn attention. Basically, they can they can learn um, uh, to remember important things, uh, but that doesn't mean that they can preserve everything that a musician sort of puts into the sauce, right? Which is exactly what we do in, 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 the, in the symbolic approach, right? Because you have, as you said, all these nice constraints and, you know, everything needs to match nicely. Uh, but then there you have the laws of, it's just, you know, it's mostly a copy paste of, uh, you know, of big structures that were already present in the, in the data. So I think a, a, you know, a sweet spot in the middle is definitely possible. But not with the, you know, not with the plain language models that we have now. So there is, there needs to be some sort of way of, you know, of 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 giving attention to the upper structures uh, that that you know that are in the minds of of musicians when 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 they're composing in order for the creations to be to sound uh, more genuine. Um, thank you again. Uh, so Jay, you had a question uh, written down, but uh, since you're uh, a panelist, uh, I, I think you, you're free to ask your question right now. Okay, yeah, sorry, there was construction, but I, it's died down for a bit. It was a great talk. Um, one question or opportunity that I was kind of interested to hear your insight on is uh, now that you have sort of a computational representation of a really creative domain, uh, where you can actually understand how humans are doing creative things, uh, have you thought about understanding that human creativity, mimicking it as like a computational creativity and like trying to understand the differences between uh, how people approach computational creativity versus human creativity and drawing those sorts of uh, comparisons or co contrasts? Yeah, thanks, Jay. I, th I think that's a really interesting question. So, so far, I think so. I think this tension between mimicking, so mimicking and collaborating, is really patent in the in the in the in the creativity world, as as you're saying, and it really um, it really boils down to the to the very end of the process. I would say so. There is no real need for um, like you could you could just reuse the model as it is for you know for 100% artificial creativity, and that would be fine. Uh, um, uh, for you know, if your purpose your purpose is not to you know to deceive or to uh, to tell people uh, you know that something was human made when actually it wasn't, um, but uh, but I think that there is always this tension about uh, use for what, right? And I think th that project with uh, Karinya Curlings about the interactive you know two measures of human made content, two measures of computer made uh, content was a really interesting way of of putting this. You know, on on the side of creativity, right? That it, we we don't care so much about, about whether the objective is completely mimicking human creativity or whether, uh, you know, whether that's relevant. But when you give these tools uh, and you put them on the hands of the of the of the creative of the of the artist, you know, they think of ways of sort of using them to boost their own creativity rather than, uh, you know, just just in a way reducing it in their view reducing it to uh, to uh, to a mimicking game i don't know if this answers your question uh you know it, it does i guess you know i think there's this kind of very uh you know universal question is that you know are all mashups created equal can we really judge creativity and actually say this is better than that and i think that's kind of at the heart of your question and it sounds like you're saying well you know there there isn't necessarily like maybe something is just bad but you can't say this mashup is better than that each person has their own kind of inspiration yeah i know you're very right and and to be honest with you you know in 90 percent of the papers that you observe in this domain all of all evaluations are you know are a mix methods between uh natural language processing metrics on the one hand and then uh just musical tuning tests uh just asking a bunch of people uh you know 
are you convinced by aspect X of this? And then mixing in the in the survey, you know, human made uh, compositions with uh, with artificial compositions. So I think so I think there is an area of 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 uh, to improve and, and to explore in there too. Okay, thanks for answering. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and so while we're out of time, uh, I think we can always ask questions uh, uh, via email. Uh, so maybe, um, uh, so uh, for those who, who, who can see the screen, uh, here's the Twitter. And uh, maybe um, also for, for private uh, questions, uh, what would your uh, email be that I can post onto the chat right now? All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I I can send you that and and so that you can post it. Absolutely. Can, can I write yeah. in the chat? Uh, yes, we can. But in fact, even better. Uh, how about you send? Uh, I could just uh, use Slack to share your email. If you're fine using the same email that we've used, I can share oh, yeah, your absolutely. email on on Slack so everyone who has questions can answer there, or absolutely. can ask questions via there. All right. Um, so thank you again. And with that, uh, Alma, I think you can stop the recording.